This is VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Ana Mateo. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, Ashley tells us about events happening at some colleges in the United States. Some college students in the United States are doing something that was once unheard of, reporting other students who attend parties. Many schools are barring parties and some other social gatherings in an effort to slow the spread of COVID-19. They are also requiring social distancing and face masks, among other rules. At the University of Missouri, one senior year student is publishing pictures and videos on a University of Misery Twitter account. The images show students gathered in large groups at swimming pools, outside bars, and other places. Most of the students are seen without masks. The university has a form on its website where violations of the school's COVID-19 rules can be anonymously reported. But the University of Missouri Senior says that publishing such information on Twitter adds a different level of accountability. Christian Bozzi is a spokesman for the university, which is in the city of Columbia and has about 30,000 students. He said students have been good about following rules during the day when they are on campus, but problems happen once students leave campus. Where we're seeing our issues have been off campus, when individuals go home to their private residences, Bazi said. On Tuesday, the University of Missouri said in a statement that it had expelled two students and suspended three others. The actions were taken following violations of the school's coronavirus-related rules. Some schools, like the University of Miami in Florida, are paying students to enforce COVID-19 rules. At that school, 75 public health ambassadors are making $10 an hour to walk around campus and make sure people are wearing masks and social distancing. Reports of serious rule-breaking can be sent to university administrators. Austin Pert is one of the public health ambassadors. The senior student said people generally follow his orders, but Pert noted the program has its limits. Most violations do not take place during the day on university grounds. If people want to flout the rules and put social distancing aside for a night to go party, it's not happening on campus, Pert said. Critics say having in-person learning during a pandemic was a mistake. Ryan Craig is a higher education advisor and businessman. He said it was foolish to think that college students would follow social distancing and masking requirements. These are college students, Craig said. They are going to do what they want to do. At Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts, administrators saw an Instagram poll last month. It found that more than 100 incoming freshmen said they planned to party. 
The student running the account voluntarily gave administrators the identities of the poll takers. Those students then received a letter warning that partying could result in punishment up to expulsion, a university spokeswoman said. Nearby Boston University has received about 125 anonymous reports of violations. Ed Kellerman, a Boston University senior, said he would anonymously report a party if he heard about one. He called it a matter of life or death for Boston locals who live near campus. Kellerman said reporting parties also increases the chances of completing the school year on university grounds. Kellerman said no one wants to get sent home. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. Everyday activities, how we work, how we study, how we play, keep us connected not only to other people, but also to ourselves. They keep us grounded. Without them, we may feel lost. The coronavirus pandemic changed many of our daily activities. In the United States, the health crisis started back in March. Today, many Americans are still working from home and studying online. They are still keeping apart from friends and distant family members. Many fun activities no longer feel safe until people are protected from the virus. But not all activities. Today, we meet a woman who is using a nature activity to stay grounded through the pandemic. Marcy Lefevre lives in the state of Maryland, close to Washington, D.C. I recently went to her home and spoke with her outside her house where she has two beehives. They provide shelter for about 120,000 bees. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk right through here through that path and then we're gonna go right on, like we can even stand behind the hive, this one right here on the corner. Spring is an important time for beekeepers. They must see if their bees survived the cold winter months. As temperatures rise, the insects emerge from the hives looking for flowers. But spring 2020, was not a normal spring. Marcy Lefevre recalls that time as bittersweet, meaning it was both good and bad. With COVID, the COVID pandemic, um, this spring, having that connection to nature became even more important. With spring's arrival, um, this bittersweet, um, experience of being so joyful to see spring, but also a sense of loss for what we weren't able to do and the loss of, you know, for some people who were losing family members. Um. Lefevre describes herself as a lifelong nature lover. In 2014, she took her love of nature a step further she decided to keep bees. I mean, they've grown up loving the outdoors, but I, I do believe that by being a beekeeper, I've become even more in tune seasonally to, to what is blooming just by the behavior of the bees, so. For Marcy Lefevre, the bees are great teachers. She says she learns something new each time she visits the beehives. She watches her bees come back home covered in pollen from different flowers. The color of the pollen depends on what flowers are growing in her neighborhood. Baskets in the backs of their legs, you can see these brilliant colors. Um, there's been like an indigo, blues, um, brilliant oranges, greens, and you just wonder what are they getting into. I'd love to have a GoPro and a bee. The beekeeper says her bees ate well during the summer, 
and are well fed. She knows this by the happy buzzing sound they make. Through their buzzing, the bees tell her other things as well. One day, while near the hives, she heard a strange noise. It was like this beep, beep. She thought it was a crying child. Then she realized the sound was coming from inside the beehives. It was a new queen bee emerging. Queens make this sound to announce themselves. It was just an amazing thing. And I think that in some ways um, really captures what I love about beekeeping is just being outside um, and forgetting about humanity and people <laughs> and just being so in tune to the sound of birds, bees, the behavior of the bees. Um, when Seeing the constant life cycle of the bees has given her a feeling of hope. Being affected by COVID, I think, um, made us all in some ways have to find a way to ground ourselves. Um, and for me to come out a couple of times a week to look at the bees and see a cycle of life that, as it does every spring, that is kind of starting anew was hopeful. Lefevre says beekeeping has taught her something else, the ability to look at the big picture. And helpful to see that life was going on and will go on independent of what we as humans are doing. And I think that bigger picture just really helped me get through this spring to know that there are things that have moved through life, even with bees. Bees get sick, bees have bad years, um, diseases, and that over time things work out in the end. Lefevre says the pandemic has affected many things, but she thinks it has slowed life down a little, long enough for people to stop and listen. You know, this is a gift for everybody to connect with nature because it, um, it finds a way when you least expect it to heal us and ask nothing in return. As long as I can keep bees, <laughs> it's a gift and it's a gift every season and um, I'm just happy to be able to share it. And the honey, of course, yes. <laughs> and the honey. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. Are you at risk of getting seriously ill from the new coronavirus? Here are some things to keep in mind. 80% of coronavirus cases are mild. Young and healthy people are at low risk. Other people and those with serious health conditions have a greater risk of serious illness or even death. If you have a cough, fever, and difficulty breathing, contact a doctor and stay away from other people. For more information, visit the World Health Organization website at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. From VOA Learning English, Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. President James Madison retired after eight years in office. His Republican Party chose another Virginian, James Monroe, as its next presidential candidate. The opposition Federalist Party had almost disappeared 
by the time of the election in 1816. James Monroe easily won the election, but not everyone was happy with the result. After all, Monroe was the fourth president from the state of Virginia. The situation caused hard feelings among political leaders in other areas, especially the states of New England. Monroe sought to improve this situation. He wanted to give the top four jobs in his cabinet to men from each of the nation's four major areas, the Northeast, the South, the West, and the Middle Atlantic Coast but he could find no Westerner who would take the job as head of the War Department. So he had cabinet ministers from only three of the four areas. The West was not represented. Despite the political concerns, most Americans liked Monroe and welcomed his presidency. Historian Harlow Giles Unger has written more than 20 books, including one about James Monroe. Mr. Unger says Monroe was one of America's most beloved presidents. He had been Secretary of State and Secretary of War at the same time under President Madison. He had also been a diplomat under President Thomas Jefferson and helped carry out the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the country. And Monroe had fought in the Revolutionary War and in the War of 1812. So Monroe came out of the War of 1812 as a hero, and he and his wife, uh, his beautiful wife Elizabeth, moved into uh, what was a blackened hulk of a presidential mansion and uh, workers slathered on, really slathered on these thick, thick coats of white paint, uh, and really so thick that it, it gleamed white. Harlow Unger says the new president sought to improve the country's safety. Monroe wanted to prevent any more invasions and to extend the country's natural defenses. One of the first problems he faced was in East Florida, in land which is now part of the state of Florida. The area borders the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. At that time, East Florida belonged to Spain, but Spain controlled only a few towns in the area. The rest was controlled by criminals, escaped slaves, and former British soldiers. The area was also home to Native American Indians of the Seminole and Creek tribes. Sometimes people from East Florida would enter the state of Georgia and attack American citizens. One serious fight involved Seminole Indians and people just across the Georgia border. Monroe ordered General Andrew Jackson to march against the Indians. Jackson was a hero of the War of 1812 against Britain. He sent a message to President Monroe. It said, let me know in any way that the United States wants possession of the Florida Territory, and in 60 days it will be done. Jackson received no answer to his letter. He believed the silence meant that he was free to seize Florida. He quickly gathered a force of soldiers and marched toward Florida. General Jackson failed to capture any Indians, but he seized two Spanish towns, St. Mark's and Pensacola. He also arrested two British subjects. The two men were tried by a military court. They were found guilty of spying and giving guns to the Indians. Both were executed. 
President Monroe called a cabinet meeting as soon as he learned of Jackson's actions. All the ministers, except Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, believed that Jackson had gone too far, but they decided not to denounce him in public. Secretary Adams prepared messages to Britain and Spain about the incidents. His message to Britain carefully stated the activities of the two British subjects in Florida and explained why they were executed. Britain agreed not to take any action. Adams' message to Spain explained the situation this way. Spain had failed to keep the peace along the border as it had promised to do in a treaty. The United States had sent soldiers into Florida only to defend its citizens on the American side. The United States recognized that Florida belonged to Spain, but if Americans were forced to enter Florida again in self-defense, the United States might not return the territory to Spain. Spain had a choice. It could send enough soldiers to keep order in Florida, or it could give Florida to the United States. Spain really had no choice. At that time, Spain's colonies in South America were rebelling. All had declared their independence. Jose de San Martin led the struggle in Argentina. Bernardo O'Higgins was in Chile. And Simon Bolivar created the Republic of Great Colombia in the north. Spain's forces could not be sent to Florida. They were needed in South America. So the King of Spain agreed to give Florida to the United States. In exchange, the United States agreed to pay $5 million to American citizens who had damage claims against Spain. Historian Harlow Unger says, the negotiations with Spain led to more than just Florida. He says President Monroe and Spanish officials also agreed on the boundaries of the Louisiana Purchase. They set the boundaries on the very top of the Rocky Mountains in the central west of the United States. The mountains created a natural border. Mr. Unger says they extended American territory into the northwest edge of the continent to what are now the states of Washington and Oregon. In other words, he says, Monroe moved the American frontier to the Pacific Ocean. He really stretched the nation into an empire that reached from sea to shining sea. With the new growth of the nation, tens of thousands of people began moving west. They built houses, started farms, and created towns. And it was the first time in world history, really, that any sovereign state had granted so much land to people that were not of noble birth. And this expanded the strength of the American population. For the first time now, thousands, tens of thousands of Americans became landowners. With the ownership of land, these people were now, Americans, thousands of them, were now able to vote for the first time, were able to run for office for the first time, and really direct the course of their communities and their nations. It, it empowered the American people, and they absolutely worshipped Monroe for his efforts. Harlow Unger says that with the strength and unity of the American people behind him, Monroe could make an important decision about international relations. The issue was the rebelling Spanish colonies in South America. 
the King of Spain did not want the United States to recognize the colony's independence. And Spain asked European countries to help it put down the rebellions. Britain wanted no part of the Spanish proposal. It was trading heavily with these new Latin American countries. Spanish or even French control of this area would destroy or limit this trade. So Britain proposed a joint statement with the United States to say that neither country wanted any of Spain's territory in the New World. Britain also wanted the United States to join in opposing the handover of any of Spain's American territories to any other power in Europe. Most of President Monroe's advisors urged him to accept the British offer. Secretary of State Adams opposed it. He did not believe the United States should tie itself to any European power, even Britain. Monroe accepted the advice of his Secretary of State. He included Adams' ideas in his message to Congress in December 1823. This part of the message became known as the Monroe Doctrine. The president said no European power should, in the future, try to establish a colony anywhere in the Americas. He said the political system of the European powers was very different from that of the Americas. Monroe said any attempt to extend this European system to any of the Americas would threaten the peace and safety of the United States. The president also said the United States had not interfered with the colonies of any European power in South America and would not do so in the future. But, Monroe added, a number of these former colonies had become independent countries and the United States had recognized their independence. We would see it as an unfriendly act, he said, for any European power to try to oppress or control these new American countries in any way. At the same time, Monroe said, the United States never had and never would take part in any war among the European powers. This statement by Monroe was only part of a presidential message to Congress, but it clearly stated one of the most important of America's foreign policies. The country was enjoying a time of good feelings under Monroe, but an old problem was about to return and divide the country again. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.